Um, we're going to continue with the Explore the Universe tonight. We're talking about um, the Explore the Universe program. Just briefly, it's one of the observing, many observing programs of the RESC, which you can participate in and get certificates and, and pins. Um, there's the new Explore the Universe third edition that I was helping to edit. Um, don't need anything more complicated binoculars. You find half of the 110 objects, you get a certificate and pen. You don't even have to be a member of the RESC. Um, basically, you got 24 constellations of bright stars. You've got 32 objects on the moon. You've got 10 solar system. You've got 24 deep sky. You've got 20 double stars for that total of 110. Half of those, and you got it. And the bright, the stars that they have there, constellations and bright stars, to require half of them. The reason that they've got them on there is these are all of the alpha stars. These are all the brightest stars. If you're using the Bayer classification system, the letter in, in the name it will be alpha and Orionis or whatever constellation it's going to be. And they want you to be familiar with these if you're a beginner, especially. For the winter, those are going to be Capella and Auriga, it's going to be Betelgeuse and Rigel and Orion, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky, and Canis Major, Procyon and Gomesa, and Canis Minor, and Castor and Pollux, and Gemini. <clears throat> so let's look at those. Basically, Castor and Pollux up there. I'm going to do something a little bit different this time, and you'll see in a moment what I mean. So just to go through these, Capella is over here. The, Hexagon, which is Auriga, there's Betelgeuse and Rigel at either end, Alpha and Beta stars in Orion, there's Sirius down in Canis Major, there is uh, Procyon and, and Gomesa over there in Canis Minor. And what I want to do is start showing you some of the asterism stuff I'm working on. Orion, as it turns out, shows up in 447 of the many asterisms um, all over the world. It's a very popular asterism. This is in the ancient Egyptian sky you're looking at, where they make it part of a larger asterism, which is the god Sa. And there it is there. Canis Major, like I said, brightest star in the sky, shows up in 145 asterisms all over the world. This is a Burong, uh, an Australian sky, where it's become the wedge-tailed eagle and the jack lizard. Right there. Canis Minor, there's 55 asterisms in the world where you find this. Most of them seem to be in Southern Hemisphere, but this is a Chinese view of the sky, and it is part of their constellation of their Xinguan, South River, right there. Castor and Pollux, 137 different sky cultures it shows up in. This is an Aztec sky, ball game of the stars, right there. Arika, it shows up on 123 asterisms all over the world. And this is a ancient Norse sky where it's the Asar battlefield, or Ragnarok is supposed to happen. So lunar phases is one of the things you need. You need four of eight, and, and there they are. They are pretty straightforward. Some of them you can do in broad daylight. That's pretty easy. They want six of 12 lunar basins, and I've got this. Photoshop image that was created by uh, Tommy 2020, who basically filled in the basins to make them look like oceans, to make it sort of stand out. <clears throat> but they're very large objects. They're very easy to find. Shouldn't have any difficulty with that. You need six of the 12 impact craters, and they're all very large craters. You can see pretty plainly on this image. So that's pretty easy to pull off. Solar system objects, you need some planets. You can plot the orbital motion of one of the planets if you want. You can observe three artificial satellites, including the ISS. You can even go after sunspots. And optional stuff, you can go for eclipses if there happens to be one happening in the period you're observing. And you can even go after zodiacal light, which is where when the uh, ecliptic is, is, is very tilted to, uh, on the horizon, and this is happening at where we are in February, March, or September, and October. The sunlight reflects off of the interplanetary dust, a lot of which they've recently discovered is basically dust from dust storms on Mars, believe it or not. And that creates this kind of a 
wedge-shaped uh, pillar of light right on the horizon. And it's been observed with uh, unaided eye observations back to the days of Ptolemy and, and uh, Plato mentions it in his Republic. So uh, it's something that you should try to see. Now, can I stick my oar in the water here? Pardon me? Can, can, I, can I say something about that? Sure, I, absolutely. I just recently learned about Gigensheim. Yes. Any aware of this? Because I, I hadn't been aware of it. It's a, a part of the zodiacal light that's in the direct anti solar distant, uh, anti solar direction. Um, I just thought that was a, an interesting thing I hadn't heard of before. Well, what Plato specifically said in his Republic was that there was an entrance into the heavens for, for the souls, and it's where this pillar intersects the Milky Way. It was called the Cosmic X. Uh. It's a very, very old concept. Anyway, here's all of the deep sky objects that are in the Explore the Universe program. We're just going to focus on the winter ones. We've got Messier uh, 45, the Pleiades cluster in Taurus and the Hyades. We've got in Calamo Pardalis, the, the Kemble's Cascade, which is a really good one. Uh, we've got Messi 37 in Arriga. Ari Ari we've got uh, M42, the Orion Nebula in Orion, M35 in Gemini. And in Pupus, we've got Messi 47. So let's take a look at these. To find them, the Hyades, dead easy. There's Orion. We were just talking about that a minute ago. You take the belt, draw a line across to the right to Aldebaran, which is a bright orangey star. And there's this triangle of stars, which is one of the open, closest open clusters in the sky to Earth, Malat 25. And it's right there. And it is um, quite easy to spot with the naked eye. And then again, I'm playing with ancient cultures here. This is a um, Mari sky. It appears in 117 asterisms all over the world. And this is Tainui's boat. When the Pleiades is the foam at the front of the boat, and the three stars in the belt of Orion are the glittering waters going off the back, and the, and the Hyades clusters sail. So the Pleiades, you just use the same method. It's over here, so you basically draw a line from the belt through the Hyades and keep on going. Again, it's a very close open cluster Earth to Earth. It's very easy to see with the unaided eye. It's a star nursery about 444 light years away, about eight light years across. It actually contains a thousand stars, but the, the primary stars, and depending on the culture you're talking to, some say six, some say seven, it depends on how good the sky they've got, I guess. Um, here, actually, this is actually number two on the list of star clusters or, or asterisms that show up in world st uh, sky cultures. 274 times it shows up in places all over the world. And this is an Aztec sky here, where it's the marketplace. Now, Kemble's Cascade is an asterism. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about the asterisms uh, later. But right here, you can see right in the middle of the image, a line of stars going down diagonally from the top right to the bottom left, right right in the middle there. That's the cascade. It's, it's a beautiful um, line of fifth to 10th magnitude stars. Uh, it spans about five moon diameters. And it was actually named by Walter Scott Houston in honor of um, Father Lucien Kimball, um, who discovered it. I've actually got Kimball's uh, log book. So I, I, I know that he was a, a big fan of this and you can understand why it's a beautiful one. He was actually a member of the REC. He joined in, in 1971. And in 81, he trans he was originally an unattached member. He became a Calgary Center member. He was a very active member. He had an observatory called the Rod what he called the Roger Bacon Observatory at the Mount St. Francis Retreat, where he was... Uh, working and uh, he got the Chilton Prize in 1989. So unfortunately he's no longer with us, but there is a number of asterisms in the sky that are named for him like Kimball's Kite. And uh, he's quite a fan of asterisms. Anyway, you want to find this. There is the Hyades cluster over on the left. There's the hexagon of Origa up there. You can see the W of Cassiopeia down there and the Little Dipper uh, over there, right in the middle of all that is that triangle, which is Camilla Pardellis. <clears throat> and that's what we're shooting for. So to zoom in, there's the triangle of Camilla Pardellis up there. 
you can see the cluster kind of intersecting that line that forms one side of the triangle. Pretty easy to find. Messier 37 <clears throat> is right over here. We've moved a little bit over now to, to Ariga again with Capella in the corner there. And this is often referred to as a January salt and pepper cluster. There's a number of salt and pepper clusters up here. People seem to be obsessed with naming things for salt and pepper. But one of the other common names, if you're treating this as an asteroid, then this is skull. Can you see it? It's sort of lying on its side with the jaw over on the left, and the top of the skull on the right, the two sort of dark patches forming the, that, the eye hole. It's quite an interesting cluster. Orion Nebula is another one of the targets in the winter list. And it's right down here in the middle of the sword of Orion. And if you're in a it, it's called the Cousins. It's one of two nebula in the Northern Hemisphere vis visible to the naked eye. The other one's the Lagoon Nebula, Messier 8. Messier 35 is on the list. We're moving just a little further over, right down here. You see there's Castor and Pollock, the twins, the, the stars at the top. And this is right above the Castor's foot there. And it's not really the reason it's called the shoe buck buckle cluster. It isn't because it's close to his foot. It's because if you look at it, it's kind of got a square shape with a kind of a tongue sticking out the side. It actually looks something like a shoe buckle if, you're, if you've gotten the measure. Messier 47. Over here, we've gone down to King of the now. It's serious. If you are... Uh, you notice that the Orion's in the top right there, so we've moved down to the other side here. And this is over in the, in the actually in the constellation of Cupus. But there's a whole cluster of Messier and NGC objects there. And this is right in the middle of it. If you, if you draw a line from uh, Mirzam, Beta uh, Canis Majoris through Sirius, Alpha Canis Majoris over, you'll, it points directly over towards Messier 46 and 47. And there is an American astronomer, Steve Saber, who is quite a fan of asterisms. And he, he sees a box on the stick. If you look in there, you can see right in the middle, there's kind of a, a diamond shape of, of stars, which is a box. And then there's a bunch of stars coming down the line. That's going to be the stick. But the other thing that you need um, for the Explore the Universe is double and multiple stars. You need half of the 20 that they've listed on the list. And there's only two in the winter list that you need to chase after. So one of those is Theta Tare and a one and two, which if you're looking at the Hyades, which we showed you earlier, it's a triangle with Aldebaran in the corner. If you look at that side halfway down on the triangle between Aldebaran and, and Prima Hydam, you'll see these two stars quite clearly right in the middle there. So they're pretty easy to find. Looks like that if you go to the eyepiece. And the other one is Delta Cephe. And we haven't talked about Cepheus. The, um, it kind of looks like a collapsing house there. <laughs> Just to one side of Cassiopeia, it's way north in the sky. So you'll notice Polaris is up in the top right corner there. It's, it's sort of uh, between Cassiopeia and uh, Ursa Minor. And right down in the lower left corner there, that's where you're going to find Delta Cephe, just off of the, the corner. And it looks like that. <clears throat> now, there are variable stars that you can chase after to Myra and Algol. I'm not going to get into that a lot. But if you're interested in variable stars, it's an option. You don't need it for the program, but it's something they are encouraging you to do. So other programs you can do really briefly, just cr cr cruise this, uh, explore the moon. There are 40 binocular features. If you use that version, there's 94 telescope features, and it's quite an easy program to do. If you want to do something more advanced, there's Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. It's got about 140 objects in it. I've done it. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's a, if you're into geology, we were talking about geology earlier, this is your, your observing program, because it's all about lunar geology. There's a Messier list. It's a really good one, all 110 Messier objects, that one. Finest NGC is another excellent list. It's one that I've done. <clears throat> Deep Sky Challenge um, as a whole selection of objects which are worth uh, chasing after, including some dark uh, nebulae. 
There's deep sky gems, which is 154 objects. It's a little bit more challenging, a lot more stuff to chase after. And you can even do solar observing because somebody I know wrote this book on solar observing. And the sun's been very active lately. But Danny, I'm looking at you now, because one of the things that Danny, you got me interested in was asterisms. And one of the things that I've been working on is this world asterisms list. This is a project of the Inclusivity and Diversity Committee. And what we're trying to do is look at all of the sky cultures of the world and gather all of the asterisms in one place. So we, there is a central place you can find all of them. And then you can find the resources to explore those cultures if you want to. And so you're probably saying, so how many different cultures have we looked at so far? And it's been seven months I've been doing this now. And the answer is 383. So how many asterisms does that look like? 4,350 to be precise, including 266 names in the Milky Way. And that right there is one of the most well-known ones in the Southern Hemisphere. Does anyone here recognize that? I hear crickets. <laughs> one of the things you notice if you're in the Southern Hemisphere is, is in the Northern Hemisphere, when you look at the Milky Way, you're looking out of the galaxy. When you're in the Southern Hemisphere and looking at the Milky Way, you're looking into our galaxy and you're looking through a bunch of dust clouds. And what you see here is the emu in the sky, which also appears as a rhea in the sky in South America. Down in the left edge there, you see there's the rhea's head with a bright star, which is the eye. And then you see the body is going along to the right. So one of the things that is really common in Southern Hemisphere skies is dark constellations and Inca uh, skies or Quechua skies. It's all dark constellations. It's quite interesting. Now, when I first mentioned to some members of the observing committee that I had uh, a compiled a list this size, this was their reaction, basically. And one of them said, how on earth could you possibly say you've observed all of these? And I said, well, all of these things that you see here in this lengthy list are all the same seven stars, these ones. Because all of these people from different cultural, social, educational backgrounds are looking at exactly the same seven stars, but seeing something different because they've got different perspectives. So that's kind of what this is all about, is showing you all the wonderful different perspectives that people have of the sky. And it also means that in the process of doing this, I have collected telescopic asterisms from all over the world. And we're looking at you. So how many have we got? 290 actually, and I've actually given this list to the observing committee and, and they're all busy talking about, can we turn this into an observing program? But if you would like this, any of you, I've got it set up as, observe, as a log sheet observing thing and I have a, a table with all of them and I'd be happy to share it with you. It has Kimball's Cascade and all of Kimball's others and stuff from all kinds of other people. A lot of Canadian, uh, Contributions. Randy Packen, who has also passed away, but was a member of the Edmonton Center, gave us a whole lot of different asterisms. And uh, David Levy, who is the comet hunter, he's got a few in there. I've got one in there, actually, that I discovered. And the other day, Roland DeShane from Calgary Center called me and said, I was at the Mount Cobot party the other day, well, 2006, and went, and I found a flying saucer. And, and, and can I include it? Like, yes, let's put it in there. So um, if you have been looking through the eyepiece at any kind of object in the sky and noticed off to one side, gee, that looks like, a, and you wrote it down somewhere, but you never told anybody, tell me, because we want it on our list. Because we want to gather all of these dis different perspectives and share them with people all over the world. It, it's gone slightly further than I thought or originally imagined it would go because what has happened is we've created a Google Drive where collaborators can share information and the collaborators who are sharing information are ethnoastronomers from all over the world. I was on the phone to Dr. Alejandro Lopez this morning uh, in Buenos Aires and I've been talking to South Africa and, and the unusual conversation where it's morning and, and winter and I'm talking to summer and, and um, the, the next day in Australia. 
But there's a lot of people who are very, very excited about this. And um, the official launch of the, the World Asterisk Project is June 2022, but we are ready to start showing people research so they can start uh, playing with this now. And if you'd like to uh, see it, let me know. And certainly if you'd like the uh, asterism list, it's all yours. And I'm gonna stop there, see if there's any questions. Did you get any pushback about the whole cultural appropriation question? No, basically some parts of the world have got a lot of ethnoastronomers working on this sort of stuff, Australia being an example. Um, it, the Oceania is, is an area where you see a lot of activity. In some areas like Africa, there isn't very much. It's, it's a bunch of keen astronomer enthusiasts that are providing us the information, but it's, it's kind of limited. And what you discover with cultures all over the world is some like, um, Navajo, Dine, have taken charge of their, their uh, skies and they are putting up publications and they have websites on it and they have spokespeople and, and it's, you know, there's a lot of information. Others, nobody is in charge of it. You can't point to anyone in that community and say, this is the person that's the go-to if you want to know about stars. And what happens is you have people going around and gathering little bits and pieces from talking to elders. What you must understand is that, <clears throat> well, there's several things. One is there is no, you can't trace any of this back to a golden age where we can say all of the Greeks saw the sky this way because everybody knows that in, in, in our culture today and in, in the culture then, people had different opinions and ideas and it, it wasn't any different then. And you could say, well, Ptolemy saw the sky this way back then, but there were all kinds of other people that had different ideas. And if you look all over Europe, you find where you think that they were using Ptolemy stuff in the sky. They had, you go to the Ligurian Alps in Italy and they have their own names for Orion and the Pleiades and so on, because they use them for organizing their agricultural cycle. So you, you have to understand a lot of this has to do with sky stories. This is really evident in places like Africa and yeah. um, in Australia, because the stories are an explanation of how the world works and how their laws and initiations work. And you can imagine someone standing, talking to a bunch of people around the fire, fire and pointing at the sky and saying, and there is the All Father, and there is, you know, so it, it's the skies are all a reflection of what's happening down in the earth. It's really evident when you look at Chinese Zing ones because they've got everything up there. They got hundreds of them. It's a very, very complex sky. So um, fascinating field. It is, it's, it's our hope that by putting this stuff in a place where people can share it, because ethnoastronomy is a relatively new um, area of research, that, that some of these, someone in these communities will take what we've assembled and go, you know what, I'm going to be the caretaker of that now. That's our stuff. And hooray, that's what we want. That's what happened with our Alifax Center in the Mi'kmaq. Mm -hmm. They brought our astronomers in, they shared their stories, they figured out how to use their lunar calendar again, they've got Moon in the 700s, which is uh, the Big Dipper and a whole bunch of stars from the handle down to Arcturus, which is the hunters chasing the bear, and it's this whole story that goes with it, and you see the same story in Anishinaabe and, and Inanu and all these other neighboring cultures. So. Um, so we're, we would absolutely love to, to have the knowledge keepers share their own information and wherever possible, that is the way we, were, we are setting it up. We are pointing to their sites, like the DNA, for example. If you wanna know about them, you talk to them. But where that isn't possible, then we're connecting you with an expert who studied that culture, who can share uh, the culture with you and tell you what we, you know, yeah, obviously some cultures like uh, Inca or Aztec or, or Babylonian, you know, from the Malapan tablets, they don't exist anymore. So that's what you're working with is, is experts. Okay, Long great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Charles.